Welcome to the third session of Excellence Talk. The topic of this third session is the selling excellence. And again, we are together with uh, Christian. Hello, Christian. Hello, Moritz. Good to see you again. Nice to How see you. How are you? Thank you. I'm fine. And you? Me too. Thank you. I'm working out of my home office right now. Okay, perfect. After Tikopia, I decided to come to my uh, hometown. Uh, it is Shavshat. Uh, it's a, you can see that you can see all the shades of green here and it's an awarded uh, city that is called uh, Sita Slow uh, with the beautiful nature and also very calm and uh, the traditional houses that you can find there. So you can see that I'm enjoying the weather and also very nice uh, nature here. What a nice place. Thank you. Thank you for sharing this. Uh, welcome, uh, Karsten. Hello. How are you? Hello, well, very happy, honored to be here. I'm looking forward to this, Murat. So we have a guest, uh, Karsten. Uh, Karsten is a public speaker. Uh, he's a, a lecturer, he's a trainer on public speaking, and he's an award-winning public speaker also, that he got uh, Belgium level and also international level uh, championships that he was awarded. Uh, and uh, he trained uh, in the corporate that he provided the trainings. Uh, for example, also uh, he came to GC Europe, uh, where we have been uh, get a, a training about the how to pitch effectively on ideas. It was in the Open Innovation Network. Uh, he also gave a lecture in the Fletic Business School uh, to uh, my uh, uh, friends also that we are in the MBA we are studying. Uh, so he's a great uh, sp uh, speaker, great coach on public speaking and. Uh, we are very happy to be uh, together with him in this third session on the communication, on the uh, how to uh, persuade uh, the ideas, because he's teaching how to teach, uh, he's teaching uh, the art of generous persuasion. And it's very important in our life, right? Welcome again, Karsten. <laughs> yes, thank you. I look forward to talking about that a little bit. It is important. Of course. So we use it in our life in the not only the business in also our private life that we use this communication essential for our life what do you think christian yeah i think uh, we all know uh, morat and, and karsten it's not enough to have a good product or service we need to be able to sell it um, meaning to convince people uh, um, of about the benefits of this product or service some organizations are very good on this and i may mention apple and others are not so successful. So uh, there is a big difference. Um, and uh, we, I think Murat, both of us, we want to sell excellence. Since we believe if more organizations would adopt excellence principles, the world would be a better place, right? Indeed, indeed. Why is that? Why is that since both of us have many years of experience by using excellence, bigger and smaller organizations and our, our own organizations and we know it works excellence works and excellence principles are very simple like in a family being on time is an excellence principle if you are on time you avoid frustration and everybody's happy or hygiene take hygiene in a hospital or whatever okay it's an excellence principle it has numerous benefits so Excellence principles are part of our everyday life. They are very simple and they generate multiple benefits for us and for our stakeholders. So why don't more organizations use excellence then if it's so simple? Well, maybe many models, many excellence models are just very complex and difficult. And the other aspect, maybe even more important is that the benefits of excellence are not well communicated, even if they are there. So what a coincidence that we have Karsten went with us, who is an expert of this. Karsten, can you share with us the art of communication? How can we sell excellence better to make the world a better place? Karsten. Yeah, thank you, Christian. Uh, Christian. I hope I can, and I think I can. Murat, you mentioned at the beginning that I talk about uh, the art of generous persuasion. So that is my frame. 
for public speaking, for communication. And let me evolve a little bit on why I do that. I do it because, especially in corporate environments, there is a bit of a tendency to see communication as a technical transaction, mm -hmm. where you take information, maybe a PowerPoint slides, facts and numbers, whatever it is, and then you transfer it into somebody's brain where you let it drop and then it's all inside the other person. And of course, actually, everybody knows that this doesn't work. But the tendency to approach communication that way is everywhere. And as one example, in my trainings, people practice presentations. And when they start, we always ask, what do you want to achieve with this presentation? What is the goal of it? And then four out of 10 people, always four out of 10 people will say, my goal is to inform. So that could be inform about GDPR, you know, the new law on data protection. I'm sure you've heard presentations about that. Or it, yeah, or it could be to inform about the new strategy or to inform what my department does. Now, I cannot argue that you cannot communicate to inform, but my experience is, and yours too, I'm sure, is that if you approach communication in that technical way, then you leave behind 90% of what it means to be a good communicator. And that's why I don't talk about communication, but about persuasion. And persuasion really means nothing else that you have in every moment, every time you communicate, whether it is a presentation or when you walk into somebody's office and have something to say, that you frame your communication as an act of persuasion where you have a very clear goal. And so I think that's where it starts with. Selling excellence is, first of all, to accept that you're selling this and that this is your job to go out and make this appetizing to people, to convince them, to persuade them. All these are action words, aren't they? That we go out and we want a change. And I think that's the most important thing about communication, that people, we always remember that we always remember that we are agents of change. We want to bring about a better future. Now that sounds big, but even in a small moment, you, what is the change that you want to bring about after the 10 minutes that you've spoken? And now again, the big goal in our case here is to sell excellence, but the goals will depend on the situation. Sometimes you will have a first talk with somebody about excellence and then maybe your persuasive goal is to make sure that you plant the seed, that people say, oh, Maybe we should be going for excellence so that the next time you speak with them, they can embrace it more fully. Those are goals and that's the act of persuasion. So I think that's important that we accept that we are agents of change. And now the question is, of course, then how do you do that? How do you persuade? Well, first of all, let me say that the idea of framing communication as persuasion is not my idea. Mm -hmm. That is, Murat, you quoted Aristotle in the last the excellence session, talk. Yes. And Aristotle, yeah. And Aristotle is the grandfather of rhetoric, if you so want. And he defined rhetoric, the first communication science, as persuasion. And he also told us how we persuade. And the most important thing in this, really, according to my interpretation, is that we have to be generous as persuaders. That's why I call it generous persuasion. And to be generous means really that you have a goal, but you can only reach that goal by being there for other people. And Aristotle said that, for example, you as the change agent, as the speaker, as the communicator, you need to be disinterested. That is not uninterested in your topic, but it is to be disinterested in yourself. And that is such an important insight that we realize that, that we've got to be, of course, we are always interested to make a good impression. I want to make a good impression right now. You want to make good impressions to your bosses, your clients. We all want to do that. But our interest takes the back seat and the interest of the people we're speaking with and communicating to, they take the front seat. And the audience needs to feel that. And that's also the job of a persuader, of a change agent, to actually find out what people need in the first place. And I like to see us then as communicators also as sensors. If we talk about excellence in an organization or in a family, then we need to be sensing 
what people need and be aware of where the gaps are and, and about their feelings also. So in, in many change management processes, and I think in, in selling excellence as well, you may have people who are afraid that if you improve so much, their jobs are at stake. So if people are afraid, you have to deal with that. And that's actually what a generous persuader does. Uh, he or she is aware of what people need, of where their feelings are. And then the next step is to step up and deal with that. So actually, for me, communication then and persuasion is much less about these little tips and tricks, but about this mindset of accepting that we need to step up and achieve things according to what we find in, in the organizations in, and what are the barriers also, get the barriers out of the way that are in the way of us selling excellence. So that for me is the basis of it all. And I could actually stop there. If you said, if you gave me five minutes to talk about communication, then that's where I would stop. But I think you're giving me a little bit more time, right? Yes, please, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I actually wanted to share now three tips, but I've got two big ones. And the last tip then is just a very short one and, and one that you surely will recognize. So my tip number one, here is, I brought my own little PowerPoint <laughs> slide, a piece of paper. This is Enagaya. Enagaya is an old rhetoric principle. It's, it's ancient Greek, Enagaya. And the best way I can explain it is by saying the following. Yesterday, I went into John's office and I was hardly in the door when John said. So what happens now? I think probably two things. First of all, you may be curious about what John said, right? which is just what happens when always, what always happens when something happens, there's a continuation and that will make us curious. But that's not the main point I want to highlight. The point I want to highlight, and that is the principle of Enagaya, is that I'm sure that the moment I said this, that your brain couldn't help but visualize a scene or start seeing a scene. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you're not in Christian Murat, yeah, I guess. Yeah, but, uh -huh, this, uh -huh, yeah uh -huh. the same happened to you as well. And so probably you started seeing me going through the door and then stopping, and maybe you saw uh, John uh, behind a desk or just standing up. Mm -hmm. We will all see it in different ways, but our brain cannot help to make scenes and picture scenes very automatically. It's the same, of course, that happens when we read a book. Uh -huh. And the ancient rhetoricians of ancient Greece and Rome, they knew that our brain works like that. They knew that the power of communication is to be building these scenes that you can see as much as possible. And yeah, Murat, I, I adore much the company where you work and you do great work. And I don't know how the culture is in your company or maybe it's not so bad, but in a lot of companies, the average PowerPoint presentation will have just maybe 5% of Inagaya, yes. 95% of abstract. When really, it should be the other way around. Uh, we should be in Inagaya 50% of the time, 60, 70, 80. Not to overdo it, maybe we don't need 95, but we need to be there a lot. We've got to speak in scenes and visual languages. And when you do that, then communication really changes and the effect you are having changes. And the best example I have for that is from a company I've worked with during many, many years on a regular basis. This was a manufacturing company who had, and oh, this is a situation you probably know many, many, many fold, uh, companies in the West that adopt principles like lean, that come from Japan, continuous improvement, et cetera. And implementing that for them isn't always easy, which is one thing, but the other thing is that companies very technically often communicate about these things. And so did this company. They were saying, this is where we are today. This is the challenge. Um, this is where we need to go. And the gap is here. So this is what we need to do next. And as you can probably hear from the way I stereotypically tell that now, that's not very inspiring. And it didn't work very well. And then one day, the person responsible for this process took another approach 
and he started writing not a report but a letter to the organization and the letter started with the last months i've been visiting all our factories and sites and on the following pages i will summarize a little bit of what i saw and of what i learned and you can already feel that this is going into a world of visual language of scenes and that's what this letter did he he was in this factory and spoke to somebody there and by that conversation he learned this somewhere else he saw that and just by changing this perspective everything changed because first of all of course now it's a personal mm -hmm. perspective it's not a universal truth it is his view and that is so much more endearing and also when you talk about your view and what you've seen your emotions come up again and you are more in contact actually with what you're saying and maybe most importantly is that people could actually picture these scenes he was talking about and so what happens now things that we can actually see and that we've seen once we remember very easily and so all of a sudden our information if you so want to call it the things that we talk about become transportable because other people start retelling that which is what happened in this example so that's the first tip i really wanted to share in agaya is a bit of an abstract word but you i hope i made it more concrete <laughs> it is it is to be visual and create scenes all the time and maybe in our conversation later we can talk a little bit if you're interested on how we mm. can do it it's not difficult to do people just need to get into the rhythm of doing it. so that was the first thing the, the second big thing that i want to share then and i know that you're accustomed to that already but this is I, so important i think for everyone to know and that little trick is called mm. metaphor and I have a great example of metaphor, uh, Christian and Murat, because I saw your last excellence talk. And you alluded to that same metaphor already in this talk, and, and you, you both used it in your talk, and it seems to be your metaphor for talking about excellence. And that is, when, I, when you talked about it, I suddenly understood excellence. Why? Because you started at what first was an example, mm -hmm. and you said, excellence, you can do that in a family and then you told me what excellence means in a family and you know you can explain this much better but this is probably a sign of visual that that you were visual about it and that i could easily remember it and repeat it now in some way i remember you saying that it's about making all the stakeholders in the family my wife my children uh my grandmother maybe if she lives under the same roof or my mother that i need to make them all happy that it's about happiness of all stakeholders. But then that already we can, so could see in the family, that is not always so easy because my, what makes me, me happy may not make my wife happy and situations are always different. So everything's in flux. But then you said that the job then of excellence is to put all this into a harmony. And then you said, well, in a company, it's the same. And in that moment, the family became a metaphor in, in my view at least for uh, for the whole concept of excellence and now the, the family is the metaphor on how to achieve excellence in a company and that is just brilliant and I've, i know because we've talked about it before that you are both striving for simplicity in communications yeah. and this i think is the thing about simplicity that if you or if we say simple it's also easily misunderstood because people have this connotation with simplicity that yes, it's simple as positive, but simple is also not always seen as so positive, maybe. And I think what this simplicity of the metaphor does is actually the simplicity of it is really that it's relatable. And so whenever we talk about a complex reality, and you know, as simple as you will try and want to make excellence, there's still a complex reality that this excellence is dealing with. But that's the magic of this simplicity that it, it makes this concept of excellence relatable through me. That's what the metaphor, metaphor does. We all know how a family works. It's something we all relate to. It's something we understand. And that is part of the definition of metaphor, that you compare one thing with another thing mm -hmm. that we understand intuitively and better. Mm -hmm. And the big power then, I think, of a metaphor is when it captures so much the essence mm -hmm. 
of the complexity, if you so, so will, that you can always come back to it. And in that moment, a metaphor then becomes a running metaphor or an allegory, something that captures so much the reality that you can always come back to it. I'm yes. sure you're doing that a lot with the family. Another metaphor that does that is the metaphor of a journey, all the things that can happen on a journey, right? You, you may have a destination at the beginning, in the middle you might see that you need a stop, another stop, another night maybe somewhere, or you get to a fork of the road in the road where you need to decide, do I go left and right? You might find, may find that your map doesn't work. That's a metaphor also like the family that you can always come back to. So that is the wonder of metaphor. Those are the two main big tips about communication that I want to share that if change agents as we are, if we employ those, then we will be much more successful, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And now I want to make a third add-on tip, which is, which I can say in one rhetorical device, which is called epizusis, which means nothing more than having three times the same word. And so my third tip is repeat, repeat, repeat. <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you thank you Karsten uh, would you like to add another uh, word or we will continue yeah, with my the, pleasure. our question that because we were waiting your uh, very nice uh, introduction of the very nice tips that you give and we will always forget uh, remember it because you also repeat repeat and repeat and this was really clear message for us that you will be continue these tips for forever and we will repeat them what do you think, Christian? I am deeply impressed, Karsten, I, and happy and so grateful for these tips. Um, let me start with the metaphor, uh, the simplicity of the metaphor. Since, yes, I've, tr I've, I've used that example of a family to introduce the quite complex um, structures of excellence. And uh, recently I had a challenge. Um, one of my customers is BMW in China, 20,000 people. And uh, we have assessed um, the organization and I've communicated with top management and the usual way and these all technicians and they understand even complex things no problem but then the challenge came and, and, and somebody told me look now we have convinced 19,800 people uh, and uh, 200 people but the other 19,800 we have not convinced how can we communicate these quite complex principles with all the rest of the people which are all chinese people and they don't even speak english so i've developed together with my chinese partners uh, a little um, cartoon featuring a street vendor a chinese street vendor he sells chicken and uh, we developed all the principles of excellence um, by using his customers who are not satisfied with the quality of the chicken and uh, it's it, it, uh, you know it tastes like cheap and uh, then there was a little uh, you know there was a uh, an employee who was satisfied with the working conditions and, and we developed all the principles of excellence and at the end um, the solution was that the street vendor like listened to his stakeholders and improved the quality and the relationship with his employee and uh, improved his business. And this even involved his parents uh, who were um, those who, um, who gave him the money. So bottom line, um, we, we put a whole big business into a street vendor's business and uh, it was a big success. Um, this was a training for, for almost 20,000 people and they were all happy about it and now they understand what excellence means. So um, my, I'm, I'm so grateful that you confirm that this works since my, my uh, worries, and this is also my first question to you, were always, is this transferable? Can people really transfer simple examples like a family or a street vendor into the big complexity of a world business, Karsten, is that possible? Well, you just gave me the best story I could ever tell about it. Okay. Uh, you know, community even to a culture that you don't know. You've obviously proved that it is so, um, but I, I think it is. And I think it leads back to the relatability, that if you find situations that people relate to, then people, even cross cultures, are not that different. Uh, I, I, I don't know whether we talked about that before, but my wife is Korean, and mm. there is a lot of cultural difference, of course. But many principles of communication and how to reach each other are not that different after all. 
So I, I think if you find the right metaphor, if you talk from the heart, then yes, we, it is transferable. Wow. Thank you for the confirmation. That is, that is a fantastic insight for me. And uh, well, and the confirmation that, that we should keep using metaphors uh, as simple as possible, Murat. Uh, have you done uh, similar things at GC by using simple metaphors, simple examples to explain complex things? Uh, I think this, uh, what uh, Carson was saying, the journey, that our journey was the same way. Uh, in 2005, we started this journey of excellence in GC Europe, and then we showed this in a like a road, and then we show each road that we achieve another level of excellence in the EFQM excellence. Uh, for example, we are the recognized for excellence, four star, five star, then we say that we were in the finalist and then we were the prize winner and we showed this road to the old associate and it was uh, everyone that in the organization was very clear that which was our road mm -hmm. over the years and i think that it could be a good example mm -hmm. uh, also mm -hmm. i know mm -hmm. that we have been discussed several times also the example what you give the family that this was a clear example we use over the time in our organization as a training also to really create this excellence approach simply that we have it in our life, mm -hmm. in our family. Mm -hmm. How we can mm -hmm. be, uh, who are our stakeholders, uh, our family members, and this is about actually that we make it clear to all our uh, associates in the company also. I think it's a good two examples that I can give. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, the last uh, example, episiosis, uh, which means just repeat uh, three times or something, I've, I've also used that and it works. So again, a confirmation. And uh, you know, th there was one breakthrough uh, moment, I think in my life, um, uh, once I had to organize a big uh, company event for 16,000 people, it was a merger situation where a German organization bought an American one, the two different cultures and there were worries and fears and everything. And anyway, so I had the challenge to organize this big event. And um, by preparing this and touring around all these factories that were involved, I found one factory that scored extremely high uh, in people satisfaction. So uh, these uh, thousands of people in this factory, a big factory, um, were very happy uh, with top management and uh, the working conditions and everything, much more happy than in other factories. And uh, so I talked to the um, to the managing director of this factory. What, what is your secret of success? Why, why is that so different to your colleagues? And I mean, you're saying the same company. And the answer was, I have very simple principles to share and I keep repeating the same messages. Mm -hmm. This is what he told me. I think it's 20 years ago. I will never forget this. So this is probably, uh, Carson, is, is that correct? Is, is that what you mean with um, epithesis? Yeah, uh, just to clarify, about the word it's what I mean with repeat repeat yeah, yeah. repeat that we should not be shy to repeat mm -hmm. the core the essentials come back to the metaphors yes. that we know yes. where that work and keep telling the same stories and inspirations that 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 inspire us and and the example that you gave come back to the same principles mm -hmm. yes that's mm -hmm. what I mean just to clarify Epizusis is just the rhetorical device for seeing, saying three times yes, the same yes. word. So repeat, repeat, yes. repeat, yeah. repetition uh, is, uh, so the message is yes, repetition. Yes, yes. and uh, I, I think that is so important. You know, to, to tell you a little anecdote that Murat relates to, because you also know uh, our friend Daniel Mouquet, who is uh, a very good speaker and also very good at speaking himself. And he has got a favorite quote, which is the one from uh, Isaac Newton. Mm -hmm. If I have seen further, it is standing on the shoulders of giants. Mm -hmm. And I've heard him quote this once. I've heard it quote him again. I've heard it quote him a third time, and a fourth time, a fifth time, a sixth time. And you would expect that I really get tired of it, but no. It's totally the contrary because each time he connects so much with this quote, it gives him so much meaning. And that quote, by the way, is a metaphor, of course, as well, um, that every time I'm touched again. And that really taught me, yeah, the things that I, as long as I keep connecting to the story that I've told before, 
or to this quote that means so much to me, or that I repeat this principle that I believe so dearly in. As long as this belief is there and my passion for it, and as long as it has a place in our persuasion effort, then we should repeat it um, as often as we can, absolutely. And uh, another very famous example is the speech of Martin Luther King, I Have a Dream. And I don't know whether you heard about this, but Martin Luther King and his advisors were very clear that on the day he spoke in Washington, they were not going to mention this. They said, we have used it too often before. This people are tired of hearing this. This will not work. And his speech was called a different way. Uh, it had a different content. And then legend goes that right behind him or one of the people sitting close to him was the gospel singer Mahalia Jackson, who said, tell them about the dream, Martin. And the first time she said it, he either didn't listen or he wasn't ready. And she said it again, tell them about the dream, Martin. And the third time, tell them about the dream, Martin. And then he said this part of the speech that, that really makes this, it, it is a very good speech throughout. But this is where the spark, where, where, where the spark sparked over. Uh, and it, it's just for me such a big lesson that if something works and if we believe in it, and if we also know that telling it, we, we touch so much our inner feelings with it, and we, we can touch others with it, then let's do it. Then let's not get tired of repeating our messages. Wow, that's so powerful, Carson. Um, I, have, uh, I have another question on, uh, on the first uh, tip that you shared with us, Energaya. And uh, it's difficult to understand. I mean, I've, I've been using pictures and I've trying to building scenes. Um, what would be your advice? Uh, which type of pictures or scenes could be built when we try to sell excellence? Oh, that is a question that is difficult for me to answer because I'm not so much a selling excellence yes. expert, but let, I don't think it matters so much which scenes you build. Yes. I mean, again, I think this should be relatable. Yeah. I think for me, the important thing is, and you've built now already, both of you, um, some scenes in your talking. Mm -hmm. So every time basically you talk about an example, mm -hmm. you're building a scene as soon as it is a very concrete example yes. where in a place, certain place of time, somebody does something or two yes. people interact. So when you said, for example, that this manager in China uh, said, well, you know, I repeat the same things. As soon as you have a dialogue, for example, then we start picturing things. And my main advice really about this is um, to not overthink this. And, uh, if, and that's some, something I've, I will never forget when I, I was invited once to speak in Rome. The speaker after me was a storyteller. It's called Davide Bardi. He's one of these people who goes to all these different storytelling festivals. And he told us what storytelling really means. And he said, it's, it's not like acting, but it's like making cinema, but a cinema that people make in their head. And then he said, how do you do that? And what he said in Italian was parole banali. That the way to do it is with the most simple words. We're not trying to be poetic or describing anything. All we have to see, yesterday I went to John's office. And you know, Steve Jobs, he's got a famous origin story of where he got some of his major ideas with. And, and that's a story of where he reads the magazine as a young person. And, and so he tells of this moment. And that, I think, is really what it is, that it's not so much the type of scene we paint, but that we go back to these moments, that we become collectors of moments. So whenever you are actually touched with something, mm -hmm. or you have an insight, mm -hmm. I think what most people do is they keep the insight and say, mm -hmm. then, you know, I think it's important that we do this, instead of saying, I remember 30 years ago, he and he said this, and that's the moment when I realized this. So just as soon as somebody stri something strikes you, collect this moment and just tell the moment of where somebody else told you something or where you watched a film or read a book or read an article in a magazine and just tell us this. And that's very often all we need to see something and for you to find this reconnection with what it really means to you. Karsten, I think now I understand why you're such a famous speaker <laughs> and uh, why you're so successful in persuading people about um, well, anything related to communication, since I can virtually feel, um, touch what you say. 
and um, so it becomes extremely realistic. And uh, I think I can keep it in my head without even I, I keep making notes, but I think I don't need the notes since I, I'll keep that in my head uh, just due to the way you are explaining things. It's fantastic. Well, fantastic. that is um, then really good news because I think that is what yeah. we should be doing. We we should be talking in ways where where, where we touch people um, or the information that we do give that 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 people just take it and can run with it. Yes and also get back to it at the moments mm -hmm. when they have important decisions yeah. to take. Yeah. And, and that's what as communicators we need to do. I, I think we need to, as mentioned earlier, that's for me still the most important part that we are agents of yeah. change. We need to know what people need. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we need to give them hope. Sometimes we need to give them a sense of possibility. Um, other times uh, a sense of urgency. Yes. It, it all depends, but we yeah. need to step up and, and, and do that. Yeah. I think right. in this case, it's very close to do what uh, you have in your behind, your uh, simple excellence model. You said that it's a simple excellence model, Christian. Mm -hmm. And the first thing in your simple uh, excellence model we discussed in the second session is understand the stakeholder needs, like the Energia was, was saying. Who are our audience? How we can understand their, uh, stakeholder, their expectation? And it can be in front of... Uh, customer, it can be in front of the supplier, it can be in front yes. of the associate you are talking about. But the first topic, the starting from excellence, is understand what they really need for, no? What do you think? Yeah, yes. And if people understand uh, that picture, uh, that, uh, and they are aware of uh, all their expectations of their stakeholders, I think that's, that's, that's a good start. And then everything that follows uh, makes sense. Uh, so going back to, to Karsten, your second uh, tip, uh, the simplicity uh, of a metaphor. Okay, this is basically what what I have developed over the last couple of years. It's a metaphor, a simple version of a very complex thing. And uh, if people understand, then they don't need us anymore. And I mean, that's overall, I think, our target, Murat. Since you are uh, one person and I am another person, okay, we cannot share ourselves and distribute ourselves around the world. I think the only way to, to change the world, to make the world a better place is to convince more people, to persuade more people, persuade to inspire people. more people about excellence, okay? So that is spread like an avalanche and that the more and more and more people talk about this in a similar way, um, convincing more and more other people uh, that excellence principles work indeed. All right. Then what you said, that if we convince, persuade the people for excellence, the better the world will be better because we will get the values, the benefit of this, uh, what we will be implementing. So we got great tips from uh, Carson. And we will definitely use it uh, for the next occasion that we will have. It's not maybe not selling that it's called. We will persuade more people for excellence, for a better world. Would you like to say a few more things, uh, Carson? No, at this point, I mean, I don't know how much time we have left now, but, but if, if we're coming to an end, then I wouldn't like to add anything. I, I would just like to round it off by, I mean, you too are already people who are inspiring uh, people to sell excellence or you are selling excellence. And I think you do it very well. I, I think you know, also the, the goal maybe for me is to get other people to be as inspired, as inspiring about this. And, and every time you speak, you know, I hear your conviction about this, your passion for this. Yep. And, okay. and that is next to any tricks. That is the real ingredient that, that we are these agents of change and, and people need to feel our belief. We need to step up to, to, to see where people are and, and what they feel. But it's this engagement with, um, with our fascination for, for this concept as well. Mm -hmm that makes so much. Indeed. And Thank yeah, you, Karsten. So I, yeah. Thank you so much again. And then before you close, Morat, uh, this uh, excellence talk number three, I think, um, again, uh, my gratitude, um, Karsten. Uh, this was fantastic insight into this world of communication. I've known something, but now I, number one, I got a confirmation that some things that I've been intuitively doing uh, are good and, and, uh, and probably um, beneficial, but I learned much more and um, I will keep it now forever. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. If it, can I say, I, I think every time you know, we work with people, uh, we also learn so much, don't we? Mm -hmm. And uh, I've, I learned so much in doing this with you. And the, the most fundamental thing I probably learned is that uh, your model of excellence 
is not different from the principles of communication because you two first yes. go and listen and and this concept of happiness that we're supposed to make people happy i think aristotle would also like that because that was the end point for <laughs> him always that, that people want to be happy and if we can do that if we can listen first of all and from that see what we need to do well that's a great starting point uh, for for me it, it's just showed me that the principles i adhere to are not just important in communication as such, but, but in models like yours as well. And, and that's been a wonderful learning. What a fantastic summary, Murat, huh? Thank you very much, uh, Karsten. It was a great insight, uh, great learning for us. It was always that it's a pleasure to talk with you, uh, Karsten. And also, of course, uh, with, Car uh, with Christian, it was always a pleasure to learn from you. Hopefully with these uh, tips, we will be persuade more people in the world uh, and the similar also that this excellence it can be also to everywhere that we will have a sustainable future also. We can link it to everything. Hopefully this nature that which I have been just in front, untouched nature, we will persuade the people to keep for forever also. Again, thank you very much and uh, wish you a very nice day. Bye bye. Thank you. Yeah, for thank you, you as well. In bye Germany, bye. it's Father's Day, by the way. So <laughs> oh, yes, Father's by the way. You. <laughs> okay, you did too. It was. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for having me.